you're a, a parent of children, especially young children, uh, you may appreciate those words. Obviously, kids pick up on this whole money thing pretty early on and start to form some opinions about it. Uh, I know that for in our family, we're trying to very intentionally with our young children start to teach them about money and how it works and how you should view it and handle it. But left to their own devices, right? We all have a personality. We all have sort of a natural bent towards certain things. And my kids couldn't be more opposite uh, from one another when it comes to this whole money thing. And again, I, if you're a parent, maybe you've noticed that too, if you've got multiple kids. We have one, I'm not going to name names in case you know my kids, because just to protect the innocent, but um, we have one who like takes their money to their bedroom and count, like closes the door, maybe locks it, and counts the money, right? Make sure it's all there. And then maybe an hour later does it again. Just make sure sibling didn't come in and steal some of it, right? And then maybe before bed, well, let's just count it one more time just to make sure, right? And they're the one when you're out at the store and you're like, well, kids, did you bring your spend money? You could buy something if you want. They're like, I'm not buying, I'm not using that money. That's my money. I'm not gonna use it on useless stuff or, or what, you can buy me something, mom, dad, if you want to, but I am not, I'm not doing it. Whereas the other kids like, you know, some of you, Dudes will know this. I've, I've yet to meet a woman who really likes this movie too much. But in Dumb and Dumber, you remember the scene where they're just, they find all the money and they're just passing it out like, crazy, like it's candy, right? That's the other kid, right? Hey, I got some. You want it? You know, and I'll buy you this and all that kind of stuff. And just, you, you get it. It's gone, right? Very, very generous with it. They'll buy stuff for other people. Um, but, oh, man, it just no saving. No, no, it just flies, right? It's funny. We, we just kind of we have these natural personalities, these natural bent with that sort of thing. The reason I bring it up it's because Jesus said how you and I view money and stuff, basically just our resources in general, and I'd throw time in there as well. I think there's two, two big buckets when it comes to our lives in terms of our resources, time and money. Jesus said when, how you view that stuff, how you think about that stuff, how you approach that stuff in your life plays a big role in what God can do in your life. I know it sounds funny, but Jesus himself, he said, you know what? Here's the thing. The whole point of you being on this earth is to be fruitful for me. I want to produce a crop through you, to use an agricultural term that the people of his day would have, would have understood, right? I, I, want to do, I want to produce a harvest through you of good works, of good deeds, of you making a difference in the world, of you helping me build my kingdom, right? I want to do that kind of stuff through you. But how you approach money and stuff, how you approach resources, how you think about it, how you handle it, how you... Do, that's going to play a huge role in whether or not I really can do that kind of stuff through you. Last week, we started a series called Rooted, where we said, we're going to take a few weeks and look at a very well-known parable that Jesus once told. A parable is just a story that he made up called the parable of the sower. And in the story, he said, you know, there's this farmer who went around scattering seeds. And, see, and the seeds fell on different types of soil, different types of ground. And Jesus' point was, depending on what type of soil the seed fell on, a, a crop, a harvest could be produced or not. And then he went through and he, he gave us four different types of soils. And his disciples heard all this and they said, wow, Jesus, that's great. We don't have a clue what you just said. Could you explain it to us? And Jesus said, well, good, because you want to know, I'll tell you. And that's one of the reasons I, I talk to people in parables. I'm kind of testing them out. I want to see if they really want to know. And if they really want to know, they'll say, Jesus, could you tell us a little bit more? That's interesting, but I'm not sure I understand. Those people who are like, just walked away and said, okay, fun little story, not sure why he told it. Jesus knew, they're not ready, right? They're just not, they're, they're, you know, they're, they really don't want to know. And that's, that's okay, I guess, but I want people who really want to know what God's all about, and who is he, and how do I know him, all this kind of stuff. So Jesus said, yeah, I'll explain it to you. And basically, he went through the four different types of, of soils and said, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm talking about. Really, these, these soils, these four different soils are, are different conditions of a person's life. And based on the condition, well, that'll sort of determine whether my word, my teachings, can produce something in you, can produce a harvest, can create a crop. You know, in the first one he said that there's people who we, the, the farmer could scatter seeds on and um, there's just no receptivity at all, right? These people say, yeah, I don't need God, I don't want God, I'm not interested, and they walk away, right? Jesus said that was the first one, there's just no receptivity. The second type of soil was people, that there, there was some receptivity there. I'm, oh, I'm interested, tell me more. But it never goes from the mind to the heart. It never really gets rooted. It's just kind of interesting, yeah, maybe I'll make that a part of my life. I like Jesus and his teachings, da, da, da. but it's never, it never goes to the core of who they are to where it can transform them. A third type of, of soil, Jesus said, was people that were receptive, and the seeds kind of took root, right? And I want to follow Jesus. I want to, I want to you know, really get to know him and, and make Christianity a big part of my life. And all this kind of, but fruit isn't produced. 
I'm just too busy. There's too much stuff going on. I just can't really participate. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't do that. I'll believe, and I really want to follow, but uh, there's no fruit. And then finally, Jesus said the fourth kind of soil is, is good soil, where the seed lands on it and, it, and it sinks down into the dirt, and it produces a crop, right? The, the, the stuff God wants to do in and through us to change the world, to share his light and his love and his goodness and his grace, that just doesn't, that just doesn't happen, in a bad type of soil. It only happens with good soil. And I left you with a challenge. If you're here last week, and you certainly listen or watch online if, if you missed it, or just read the parable of the sower yourself, and, and you'll, you'll pick up on this. But um, I left you with a challenge, and I asked you two questions. The first was simply this, and I said, please be real about it, because you're not going to fool God. He already knows. You need to be real with yourself. What type of soil does your life represent right now? Right? What, what type of soil? Because again, the purpose of us being on this earth is to produce a crop for God. That is why you were here. That's why you were created. It's to know him and be used by him. So if that's the whole purpose, what kind of soils does my life represent right now? Because only when you start to really wrestle with that can you start to let God work, do what he needs to do in you to produce that crop. The second question, though, I said is if you are a follower of Jesus and you do want God to produce a crop through you. Well, there's sort of a part two to this story. You also get to play the role of the farmer. So my challenge was, who are you sowing seeds to? Who are you sharing God's love with? Who are you shining his light to? And again, we've got a great opportunity. Not that it's just about this one day of the year. We've got a great opportunity coming up on Easter Sunday to, boy, invite people to come and see God, to see, see Jesus, to see who he's all about. One of the few days of the year where just kind of almost everyone in our culture still says, eh, maybe I should go to church today. Not everyone, but most people still do. So who are you sowing seeds with? But maybe more importantly to start, what is the condition of your soil? And there's one condition I want to I just uh, dive into today. I was going to say dig into today, but then last week when I used that pun, no one laughed. That was so clever, you guys. And you're like, eh. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> so I'm not doing that one anymore. But we're going to dive into this one um, particular, Dig, soil, okay, I'm just making sure we're all, okay. Um, we're we're going to dive into this one type of soil that Jesus described, because here, here's what I think. I, I may not be right on this, but here's, here's my guess. In the area of the world that you and I live in, in the time and history in which we live, I think this is the type of soil that probably most of us get stuck in. I'm guessing you're not in the first type of soil, or you probably wouldn't be here right now. I mean, some people get drug in, right? Just sit and listen to this. I'm going to reform you or what? I don't know. You know. But, but you probably wouldn't be here. But there's, there's one soil that Jesus described that I know I struggle with it. I know I walk away from the good soil and kind of plant myself back in this other type of soil a lot of times. And it's this. It, it, again, you could read the whole story if you want to, but this particular soil Jesus is going to describe here. You got that there, Josh? There we go. Matthew 13. The seed falling among the thorns, that was a type of soil that Jesus described in his parable, refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word. It, it, the seed went down. It got into the ground. It, it started to establish some roots, but fruit can't come out because the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it. I'm afraid this is a soil that a lot of us, me first, struggle to get out of. It's the condition that we often find ourselves in. If we put, our, if we put ourselves in one of these four categories, so to speak, that Jesus describes. And what's so great, that story, I believe with all my heart, because it just, the rest of the Bible testifies to this, was not a story of condemnation. Jesus wasn't saying, y'all, everyone falls into a category. I almost said y'all. Brian keeps saying y'all, our worship leader this morning, because he's from Nashville. But um, I was like, dude, y'all, that's awesome. Uh, y'all fall into one of these categories, and there you be. You're screwed. That's just where how it is. For the rest of your life, that's you. You're a really bad soil, and you're kind of good soil, but you get choked out of it. It's not what Jesus was doing in this parable. That would just fly in the face of so much of, else of what he taught. What he was doing was helping us understand, man, 
if God's going to produce fruit through, through you, you've got to have good soil in your life. So what are we going to do to have that good soil? Well, again, here's one of the bad soils he pointed out. Soil with thorns. Chokes it out. There's one story in the Bible, probably many stories in the Bible, there's one story in the Bible where I think describes how powerful and, and how big of a deal this type of soil is. I want to look at it with you this morning. It's, it's, in, the, it's in a couple of the Gospels, but we're going to look at it from the book of Mark. Mark is the second story of Jesus in the New Testament, right? So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four stories of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, we're going to look in the book of Mark. And um, in my version here, it's titled, The Rich Young Man. And Jesus has this encounter with this rich young man, and he knows immediately the soil of his life. He can just look right into his heart. I mean, he's God in the flesh. He's, I know what soil you're stuck in right now. And the story, I think, is very revealing. As to understanding, right, how dangerous this type of soil is, but also in understanding, well, if that's us, what, what do we do to get out of it? I mean, how do we escape the thorns? So here's the story. I'm going to read it here uh, straight from the Bible. It's on the screen above me as well. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Just pause real quick. Obviously, this isn't the first type of soil, right? No receptivity. Guy wants to know. I mean, he literally ran to Jesus. Jesus, tell me how I know you. Tell me how I can fit in this whole God kingdom thing. I want to know. Totally receptive. I mean, he's... He made the initiation. So uh, there's something there. There's, something that may, there's some seeds maybe that have already been planted. Something's going on in this guy's life. And then Jesus, and Jesus did this so often, and it's because he was just so smart. He often answered a question with a question. Which again, I'm sure if you, t- today it's like, wow, that's awesome. How, how smart is Jesus? Look what I'm learning from this. If you were there with him, you'd be like, Jesus, just give me the answer so frustrating. You always answer a question with a question. But we have the, you know, we have the ability to look back now and say, oh, wow, look how smart that was. Um, he says, why do you call me good? That's his first line. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. In other words, you <laughs> have already got something wrong here. You, you, about mankind and God and how it all works. Listen to what he says. No one is good except God alone. Now, if this guy understood that Jesus was God in the flesh, maybe Jesus wouldn't have answered that, but he, he didn't understand that yet. He didn't get that yet. And he thinks that a person could be good enough to make themselves right with God. He thought a, a, a person could follow the rules enough to make themselves right with God. And Jesus knew right off the bat, man, I know the soil of your life, and you're already off. But Jesus kind of goes with this a little bit and, and plays along. He says, well, you know the commandments. He's going to list off some of the original Ten Commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He's like, okay, you think this comes down to being perfect, being right, you know, do enough, follow the rules, do enough good things. Well, let's, let's play with this a little bit, right? You know the commands. And he lists a bunch of them off. Teacher, verse 20, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. To which, again, I'm, I'm sure, and Jesus is nice, and he's really compassionate with this guy, so he, he doesn't call this out on him, but I'm sure he's thinking, you liar. Come on. No one's perfect. No one can keep all this stuff, right? Yeah, maybe murder so far and adultery, and I haven't stolen anything, but you, you dishonored your father and mother at some point. And then if you really understand all of Jesus' teaching, you'd realize almost all of us would fall on all of these anyway, because Jesus came and totally redefined everything. You commit murder when you hate someone. You commit adultery when you look at someone lustfully, right? So, but, but he, let, let, you know, we'll just take it for face value. You still couldn't get that list 100%, right? No way. You're, you're human. But Jesus doesn't go there. Jesus, is, he's being really compassionate on this guy. And, he's, and, and verse 21 says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. See, what, what Jesus has just already verified that he already knew because he's God, this guy doesn't have the right soil right now. The soil of his life is not good for a crop. But he lo- even though that was the case, he looks at him, and I love it. One of, one of my favorite lines in the whole Bible, Jesus looked at him, he loved him. Some guys that I do a, a, a men's group with on Thursday mornings here at the church, um, we were talking this past Thursday about one of the, the qualities of God or, or descriptions of God is that he's our friend. 
yeah, he's king, he's lord, he's ruler, absolutely, but, he, but in the midst of that, he also says, I'm your friend. Isn't that cool? It doesn't matter what you're going through, what you've done, what people think of you, God says, I'm your friend. And, and so Jesus looks at him and he loves him like, like a friend. But like a good friend, he's going to tell him the truth. See, a really good friend doesn't let people just dive off a cliff. Good friends don't let people just swim in the ditch the rest of their life, right? Good people, good friends point people in the right direction, try to help them out. And Jesus says, well, I, I love you, and so I'm going to tell you the truth. There's one thing you lack. Okay, you kept all these. Let's just say for sake of argument you were able to keep all these commands. It's not true, but let's just say there's still one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. One thing you lack. One thing you lack. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. See, Jesus recognized that um, this guy, A, thought he could make himself right with God by doing enough good things, by following the rules enough. Certainly that was incorrect. But then Jesus also pointed out and, and recognized right off the bat that um, I think the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of this life are choking out any possibility for my harvest to be born in you. Your soil isn't good. In verse 22, at this the man's face fell. Jesus knew what he was, Jesus was right. He went away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, in other words, we, we love your kids, by the way. I don't know what's going on over there. We love your children. Just, it just happens sometimes. Jesus was right on the money. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The, the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life had choked any opportunity for a crop to be produced in this guy's life. And when Jesus challenged him to let, to let go, to do something that maybe could change the soil of his life, that's not a command he's going to give to all of us. You've got to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You, maybe, maybe Jesus will tell you to do that. But it was for this guy, because Jesus knew, oh, you're, you're being choked right now. We gotta do something radical here. We gotta, we gotta till up this soil that's covered in thorns. Get rid of them. Do something just totally drastic so you can be planted in good soil. Because the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life are choking it out. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples after this, after this guy walks away, um, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom. Let me define rich for you, okay? Basically, you're, you're rich, biblically speaking, if you got stuff. There's a lot of people in this world who don't. They don't have resources they can make decisions with. They don't say, ah, you know, spend some of this here, I'll spend some of it there. Some people that, that biblically, you're rich, means you, you got stuff that you can make choices with. You got time and money and resources that you can make choices with. It, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life, man, they, they can choke out that fruitfulness. The disciples were amazed at his words. Well, the story will keep going, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's impossible, by the way, and Jesus knew it. A camel can't go through the eye of a needle. Have you ever heard there was a place in Jerusalem where there was this thing that a camel would go through and they called it the eye of the needle. It's not really true. Um, that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was, was talking about um, an impossibility as a word picture to help people understand we can't figure this out on our own. If we're being choked out right now, right, by the, by the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth, we can't, we can't do this on, own, on our own. And the disciples knew that. They, they were amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? My goodness. Who can be saved? Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. Just like, right? Camel going through, I'm impossible. With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. In other words, this soil can be changed so I can produce a crop through it. 
All things are possible with God. If, oh, if the rich young ruler, maybe he would have just waited a little bit longer. Maybe, maybe if he would have just said to Jesus, you know, that's a, that's a hard teaching. You're telling me I need to give, but, but maybe if he would just hung in there and not walked away and could have heard Jesus continue to teach and to talk on this topic, I don't know, maybe, maybe his soil would have been changed. But he was choked out. And he walked away. And the disciples recognizing, wow, we're, you know, we're rich too. I mean, really? We got food, we got a bed, we got, we got resources. <laughs> Who then can be saved? With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And what I want to do with the few minutes we have left is, is talk about two things. One is answer the question, because I got this question a lot last week after the first message in the series. Multiple people came up to me and said, man, this is making sense, and I want to take this seriously. But what's the fruit God's really looking to produce in me? I mean, what does it mean to be fruitful? I was like, well, that's a great question. I had great conversations about it. So I I want to talk just briefly. We could spend weeks, years, the rest of our lives talking about what it means to be fruitful for God. But just for a few minutes here, I'm going to identify that a a little bit, right? What's, What's the goal in all this, in other words? But the other question is, how do we escape from the thorns? I mean, Jesus laid down a pretty tough reality, but it's reality nonetheless. A lot of us are stuck in thorns. A lot of us are in bad soil. A lot of us walk away and maybe get in good soil, but then it's so easy to go back into the bad soil, and God's not producing the, the, the harvest maybe that he wants to produce in our lives. Or we're just going to go right back to God's word on all of this stuff, uh, but first, before we talk about escaping the thorns, I want to talk about, just for a minute again, what, what does it mean to be fruitful? So again, we, as we're talking about this, we're wrestling through this, we're keeping the end in mind. And there's a crop that's prevented when our faith is choked by the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. And the four things I'm going to talk about here briefly are what we challenge our I-90 partners to do. If you've been through the one-on-one class, you've heard me talk about this before. And we've got our next one-on-one coming up actually next Sunday. If you want to take it and, and learn all about I-90 and the ins and the outs and, and how we started and all that stuff, please sign up for it. It's a great opportunity to come and do that and meet some of the leadership. Um, and, but, but I talk specifically about these four things because the Bible's really clear. These are four, there's many others, but these are four examples, four huge examples of the fruit that God wants to produce in our lives. The first one is connecting. Building relationships with other people who are heading towards God. It's huge. You can't grow in your faith ultimately. You can't uh, have that harvest produced through you by God if you're not in relationship with other people. And right now, I'm just, I'm going to take a guess. You're having a hard time developing a relationship with the backside of that person's head in front of you right now, right? You're sitting in rows. So during the week, we do things at coffee shops and in people's homes and you know, all kinds of events and, you know, uh, groups and all kinds of things, right? So you can get into another environment and start to build those connections. It's spiritual fruit that God wants to produce in our lives. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author says, and let us consider how we may, we may, excuse me, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. You have to be encouraged and held accountable and spurred on toward love and good deeds. But that doesn't happen if you don't know anyone. If you're not in relationship with anyone else. Right? And I know for some of us, we're like, well, you know, I'm, I'm introverted and I'm interested in this Jesus thing. I, I really think it's going to be meaningful for my, for my life. I don't, really, I don't really like people. You're going to have to, I don't know, you're going to have to figure it out. I'm definitely on the introverted side of things. Do the Myers-Briggs. I always fall on that side of the scale. But I know I need people. I need relationship with people. We've got to be connected to others. It is part of the spiritual fruit God wants to produce in our lives. Another one is serving. God wants us to serve one another. That's fruit. That's what God does in us. That's that's part of the harvest that he's producing, is when you and I take some of our time and some of our resources, some of our energy, some of our intelligence, some of whatever he's given us, and say, you know what, I'm going to use this for your benefit. That's why people come here on Sunday every week and work with kids, make coffee, set up chairs, It's to serve others. There's a crop being produced. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. In other words, let God produce a crop out of you. You don't don't do stuff to make yourself right with God. That's all based on what Jesus did for you. But, oh, man, if you know Jesus, let God produce a crop through you. 
Serve one another, therefore, humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. In the Bible, over and over and over again, the Bible tells us that one of the biggest ways we live out that command to love each other is by serving each other. Another one's giving. Giving of your financial resources. That is fruit. That, that is a harvest that God wants to produce through you and I. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God wants to produce a harvest. And part of that is through giving. Not just of our money, our time, our energy, but specifically in this context here, giving of our financial resources. That's part of the, part of the fruit. And then the other one here that, that we talk about when it comes to partnering with us as a church, one of the things that's so clear in Scripture that uh, God wants to do through us is inviting. Going to others and saying, you know what, I want you to see this really good Jesus thing too. I want you to come and experience his grace for your life. I want you to hear about his amazing love and mercy for you. And here's the thing. It, it, if Jesus is truly the greatest gift you and I can ever have, and he is, by the way, hands down, nothing even comes close, than to knowing Jesus, to knowing his life, his forgiveness. If that is, and some of you have tasted that gift, you know that gift. If that is the greatest gift ever, how selfish would it be for us to never share that with anyone else? How awful. And, and I'm not pointing fingers, guys. I, I go through seasons of my life where I'm like, just watching people die all around me. People who need to know love and compassion and grace that Jesus gives. I, yeah, sorry, I'm too busy right now. How selfish. The greatest gift you, would ever, you could ever know and receive into your life, and we don't share it sometimes, do we? Ugh. John chapter 1 says this. This is the beginning of, of the disciples starting to come around Jesus early on in his ministry. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John, referring to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist had pointed out to some of his disciples, hey, look, the real Savior's shown up. You, need, you guys need to go get to know him. He's awesome. Um, the first thing uh, Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. First thing he does. He had encountered Jesus. Man, I'm coming alive to, to God here. This is amazing. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. First thing he does, I gotta tell someone else. I gotta find, I gotta, I gotta bring in my brother. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. Inviting people into this wonderful, amazing, awesome, beautiful story of, of Jesus and the gospel and the redemption of our lives it doesn't have to look weird and goofy doesn't mean you got to be on the corner with a bullhorn. Please, actually, don't ever be that person on the corner with a bullhorn. It means we love people where they're at. It means we get involved in their lives, and it means we invite them at the right time to check out Jesus. We bring them to church. We pray with them. Maybe we share our own faith story with that. God will guide you. God will show you what's the right thing to do. But that's fruit that he wants to produce in us. It's inviting. So again, for, for us here at I-90, those are the four things. We say, hey man, if you're all in, you, you want to partner with us, we want you to commit to doing those four things. Connecting, serving, giving, and inviting because God wants to produce a crop through you. God wants to produce a crop through this church. So, does that describe all the fruit that God wants to do in us? No. It's a pretty good place to start. So now, how do we move from the thorns to good soil? And guys, I'm just going to I'm just let the Bible speak for itself this morning. In Matthew um, chapter 6, and remember, remember, the worries of life and deceitfulness of wealth, it really all comes down to these two big buckets of resources that we have, time and money. How do we view it? How do we approach it? How do we manage it in our lives? And in Matthew chapter 6, this is Jesus talking. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, 
and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if you go down a couple of verses, he says this. Here's the, here's the crux of the matter. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you say, <laughs> one of the reasons the fruitfulness I want to produce in you keeps getting choked out is because you try to serve two masters. But one will always prevail. Ultimately, one will be the one that calls the shots. And, and it can't be both God and money. You got to choose. We're going to skip over to James chapter 4. James says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now whenever you reach a verse like that, keep reading, because you're going to be like, whoa, that's a bummer. I don't think I want to pick up this book anymore. you got to keep reading when you hit something. There's a bigger point here. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. And then verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Here's the point. It's not that James is being flippant about our lives here on earth. He's just saying you know what, your time here on this earth is so uncertain. A lot of us have learned that lesson, haven't we? In, a, in very sad ways, we, we know, yeah, our time here on this planet is, is, is very uncertain how long it will be. So Jesus is saying, you have a choice with the time that you have. You call the shots with it, or you let God call the shots with it. And how you answer that question will determine what kind of harvest God will produce through you. Because there's one big idea, and this is what I want you to just walk away with this morning and wrestle with and pray about and say, God, where where am I at with this? We're not fruitful for God, which again, remember, that's, that's the goal, with our time and money. When we think both are just that, ours. If you're going through life right now, and again, you're receptive, and maybe you're even a little bit rooted, and you're like, God, I want you to produce a crop through me. God, I want to be part of your kingdom work. God, I want it, man, and I don't even know what those words mean yet, but I want you to use me. But why isn't it happening? It, it, it could be, could be, because the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life, how you view time and money, are choking it out. And the place you and I have to start or sometimes for some of us go back to when we find ourselves in the thorns again, is who do I really think my time and money belongs to? And if you can determine in your heart that ultimately it is his, that's where he says, okay, get out the shovels, get the pickaxe, we're going to work. We'll tear down the thorns. We'll start to, it'll be a process. You need my grace and strength to do it. But man, we'll start working on that harvest together. If you ask that question, you decide whether in thought or just practically and either way, right, the proof's in the pudding. My time and money are just that. They're mine. The crop can't come. He can't produce the harvest he wants to produce.